Father, we've come here tonight, Lord God, to hear from your word, to become more and more equipped, Lord God, for us to live in this crazy world that we're in right now, Father. We know that in you is all joy, in you is all peace, in you is our strength, in you, Father, is our stability of life. And so we honor you tonight, Lord God. Thank you for all that you've done. Thank you for the the blood of Jesus that he shed for us so that we can come and stand in your presence here tonight without any sense of guilt or condemnation, Lord, standing in righteousness, in right standing with you, Father, as if we had never sinned at all in our lives, and it's only because of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for your grace tonight. I thank you, Father, personally, for your grace to be able to teach this word, to teach this message in such a way where not one person will leave here tonight without being impacted by the word of God. Holy Spirit, we honor you. Holy Spirit, we just, we just welcome your presence. Thank you for the indwelling presence. Thank you for your anointing, not only upon our lives, but the anointing that abides in us. And we're so grateful. We reverence you. We honor you. We respect you tonight. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 amen, amen. Praise God. The key scripture we've been using on Wednesday nights for the this is the third week, is Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and we talked about this last week especially. Uh, It's very difficult for us to stand firm if we don't have a good foundation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Turn to somebody and say, you need a good foundation. foundation. Otherwise, we can't stand firm. Standing firm is dependent on the foundation. Now, where's that foundation found? In the Word of God. Who who is the Word? Jesus. Jesus. So if we have a firm foundation in the Word, we have a firm foundation in the Lord Jesus Christ. Stand firm then and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. And unfortunately, many, 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 many of us, that has been our experience. We get born again. We come out of the world. We we walk in righteousness. We now, righteousness has been imparted to us. Because forget, righteousness is not something you can earn. You and I cannot earn right standing with God. It's got to be imparted to us by the death, burial, and resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? But then what happens? What happens? Something comes. The enemy comes to try to put a hook back in us. Now, he can't stop you from going to heaven, but if he can get you back into sin, he can get you to make your life hell on earth. And that's what we're seeking to stay free from, right? That's what we're talking about. We're talking about getting free and staying free. Amen? Amen? Because we know that there's no magic wand, right? right. No, there's no magic wand. Don't you see it? Go, you can lay hands on somebody until their head looks like mine. It's not going to make a difference. The, the, the foundation's got to be in the Word. It's the Word of God that gives us the ability to resist the enemy. Amen? Amen. All right, so we're, we're, we're on track there. I'm just going to go real quick just to review uh, very quickly because I, I know there's, it's inevitable there's some people that were not here the last couple of weeks. So the common thread throughout the gospel is this concept of freedom. And what is that? As it pertains to us as believers, when we talk about freedom, we're talking about the idea of not being controlled by sin. Not being controlled. Listen to rest, because that's a given. We all know that. We don't want to be controlled by sin. But watch this now. It's also not being controlled by the flesh. What does that mean, Pastor? It means our physical nature, our carnal nature, our human nature, not being uh, enticed to go in the direction of things that are only going to satisfy us and satisfy cravings. And I'm not just talking about cravings for chocolate cake. I'm talking about all kinds of different cravings. Okay? So we can't be controlled by sin. We cannot be controlled by the flesh, not if we're going to live free. And here's the other one here that I don't think we spent enough time on unresolved wounds. Unresolved wounds will turn into bitterness. Unresolved wounds will turn into, well, it starts with unforgiveness, then moves into bitterness. Then from bitterness goes into betrayal. Okay? So we can have something sneak up on us. 
And, uh, you know, I don't know that I've ever met a person that hasn't been tra- traumatized to some degree or, no- or another at some point in life. Every one of us have had things d- done to us. Every one of us has had uh, wounds inflicted upon us. And it's usually the closer the people are to us, the worse it is to get over, the harder it is to get over. Because, you know, you expect something from a stranger. You know, I've used this example so many times. If I'm walking down the street and a stranger walks, is coming the other way and curses me out or whatever, I'm like, what do I care? I don't know who this person is. I didn't know them before. I don't know them now, so it doesn't make any difference. But when, when the enemy uses someone, and that's why it's our responsibility to make sure that we don't get used by the enemy to inflict wounds on individuals. But when the enemy entices someone that's close to us to inflict that kind of a wound, a betrayal, an abandonment, a rejection, a disappointment, that's harder to get over because it has an emotional component attached to it. I'm talking to somebody tonight. So if that's been your history, okay, uh, of rejection, abandonment, betrayals, you're going to need to guard your heart. Because what you will do is you will misunderstand others. In other words, you'll live your life like this. Every person you meet, you're going to think in your mind, you won't say it, but you'll think, okay, how's this one going to hurt me? Doing, yes or no? How's this person going to wound me? How's this person going to reject me? How's this person going to abandon me? We can't live like that. Amen? Proverbs 25, 28, another really good scripture. I'm going to read from the Amplified Version. Like a city that is broken down without walls, leaving it unprotected, is a man who has no self-control over his spirit. And look at this. He sets himself up for trouble. That's another lesson we need to learn. There's sometimes that we set ourselves up for trouble. Amen? Amen. This happens a lot when, when, you know, after pastoring for two and a half decades now, you see things, patterns. And you see somebody will come new to church, okay, and then they'll have an attitude, they'll have a chip on their shoulder because their last experience at a church was disastrous. And so they come in almost looking for trouble. They come in very, the pastor walked by me, didn't say anything. Well, you didn't say anything either. (laughs) You could have said hello. You see what I'm talking about? So, So what are you doing? You're setting yourself up for trouble. So be careful with that. Don't judge future relationships by the relationships that you had in the past. Now, don't be stupid. Don't go totally the other way. You know, mouth open, flies coming in. Don't, don't walk around like naive. Okay? Is this too real tonight or what? Because Wednesday nights are known for realness. Okay? There's plenty of people. You know, you go from one extreme to the other. You go from not trusting anybody, not wanting any relationships, to going like, oh, here, here I am. And then you get hurt. Give people time to show you who they are. Yeah, I'm told that it takes at least three years to find out what kind of fruit tree you got. You go to a nursery, buy a fruit tree, you don't know what you have. It could, the tag could have said cherry tree. You find out, then you, by the time three years later, you find out you got a pear tree. And you're still waiting for cherries to show up. So, we talked about this again. This is still review, but we got to get moving here. Okay. So, um, yeah, let's do that. Have a plan to start the day off right. So many people just jump out of bed, boom. First thing, they put the coffee machine on, go brush your teeth, drink drink that coffee, get dressed, jump in the car, run, go, that's it. Hopefully you took a shower first. But, But a lot of people don't have a plan to start the day off. And if you don't establish a plan, the enemy will establish a plan for you. You've got to set it yourself. You've got to be determined yourself. Uh, Lamentations, very familiar verse of Scripture. Lamentations 3, uh, verse 22. It is is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. What's it saying here? Fancy language. It's the mercy of God that we get up in the morning and breathe. Amen? Because if he treated us the way we deserved, they'd come to our bedroom and find a pile of ashes on the bed. 
What's he talking about here? The mercies of God. And then verse 23 says, why don't you read it with me nice and loud? One, two, three. They are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. So his mercies, every morning we get up, every time we start our day off, there's a deposit of mercy that God has set aside just for you. But if you don't claim that, you're going to go into your day without mercy, without grace, without that sense of that God is on your side. Okay, he's not going anywhere. You need to pursue him. Oh, God is God. You need to pursue him. Well, God knows where I am. Oh, he knows where you are. But he says, if you'll draw close to me, I'll draw close to you. You and I have to make the first move. Amen? So start that plan. Do that, okay? All right, let's see. We have our best days when we seek God first thing, when we wake up and start off our day with worship, with praise, with thanksgiving. It doesn't, you don't have to have a full-blown worship service in your, in your bedroom or in the bathroom. Just you lift your Father, thank you for another day. Thank you so much that your mercies are new today. Father, thank you that you daily load me up with blessings. That's good stuff, isn't it? Every day there is a deposit. But just like if you don't go and draw from that deposit, it sits there. It sits there. Now, how do you know what you're going to face throughout the day? I prayed this prayer over myself. I don't, I, I don't know how many thousands of times. Father, prepare me for that which is prepared for me. Because let's face it. Sometimes the Holy Spirit will reveal to us what direction the day is going to take. Maybe some traumatic thing that's going to happen. He may alert you to a family member. You'll, know, you'll have a knowing on the inside. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You'll have a knowing on the inside and something's not right with so-and-so, something's not right with this one, or whatever, or pray especially for this individual. But other than the Holy Spirit revealing to us, we don't, we, most of us are going into our day blind because we don't take the time in the morning to say, Lord, I don't know what's up ahead, um, but I know that you're with me. I know that you're, you're preparing me. And especially this, I don't know if many, I'm sure some people have had this experience. Uh, I know for myself, if I wake up during the night, uh, which I do most times, but if I wake up during the night and I have this overwhelming necessity to pray in the spirit, or if early in the morning praying in the spirit, I know something's coming. Something's coming. Why? Because praying in the spirit brings strength up. It draws strength up. It empowers us. What do I mean by praying in the spirit? Come on, you can say the word. What do I mean by praying? Praying in tongues, praying in unknown tongues through the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because he knows what's coming and he speaks. You see, the Holy Ghost deals with us spirit to spirit. The Holy Spirit's not going to speak to your mind. The Holy Spirit speaks to your spirit. So if you don't spend time nurturing that anointing that's within you, this is something that the Holy Spirit's been dealing with me a lot for the past couple of weeks. Nurturing the anointing within you listening to me? The Bible tells us in 1 John, I believe it's in chapter 2, that we have an unction, we have an anointing. In other words, we have the presence of God in us, and he teaches us all things. We know all things. See, the Holy Spirit knows everything that's going to happen in your entire life. From the moment that you're conceived to the moment that you take your last breath and go into eternity. Holy Spirit knows. He's the spirit of wisdom. He knows everything you're going to face. So he knows what's going on. He knows what to impart to you, okay? But the Holy Spirit is a gentleman. If you don't pay attention to him, he's going to go, I'm here when you need me. I'll be right here. I'm not mad, but I need to know from you whether you really want this or not. All right. Okay, so where do we need to go now? Let's see. Oh, yeah, this is something we talked about last week. But I want to talk about it a little bit more. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5. 1 John 1, 5. This is the message we have heard from him. Now, who's writing this? Uh, uh, 1 John. First John. So it was written by who? John. 
John the Apostle. Okay, now what's interesting with these letters, I don't know, just throw this out there for you, maybe start with some interest. First John, second John, third John, all written after he comes off the island of Patmos. After he had that experience with Jesus, which out of that experience came the book of Revelation. So you can see the difference between you read the gospel, John, and then you, when you read the letters of John, man, there's a depth here that wasn't there when the gospel was written. Not that it was, you know, it was bad. It's still the word of God. But you could see he's gotten a different revelation now, having spent that 18 months or whatever it was on that rock in the middle of the Mediterranean Ocean. Okay? So, so now, again, he's talking from experience. And so we can have a little more confidence here. He said, this is the message we have heard from him. He's talking about he heard from him, okay? And we declare to you, God is light. Now, we saw some of that in, in Gospel of John chapter 1. You see some of that, okay? God is light. In him, there is no darkness at all. Next verse. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. In other words, if you're born again, you claim to be living in the light, in the light of the word, in the light of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. But if we don't uh, have fellowship with one another, and he's talking about good fellowship, it's easy to have bad fellowship. A couple of people got it. It's easy to have bad fellowship. He's talking about good fellowship. And what's good fellowship? Good fellowship is a fellowship that's nurtured, that's based on the word of God. That's not taking advantage of somebody. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. Okay. But if we walk in light, he's seeing the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, does what? Purified. Does it say purified? purified. What does it say? Purified. Which, uh, what does that kind of insinuate? Continual. Continual action. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Now, this is important. Stay there for a minute. Because the topic we're studying these past two, three weeks is how to stay free from sin. Amen? Amen? So this kind of hints at you better take care of your relationships because that's going to cause the blood of Jesus to continuously purify you from all sin. Next verse. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, can we stop here for a minute? Oh, Lord. How many times have you heard people say, now, of course, nobody in here would be this brazen. Okay. How many times have you heard people say, people that are living in just outright sin, they're not hiding it. They're do, and, you know, listen, I can, we can drag up a whole bunch of stuff. You know when you're in sin. I hope so. Okay? We all know Christians that live in continuous sin. And when you try to address the issues to correct, what do you usually hear? Oh, no. Me and God are good. <laughs> what are you talking about? You're standing in front of me. You're high as a kite. I know you're shacking up with this one, that one, and the other one. Uh, is this too real? Did he just say shack up? <laughs> And then when, when out of love, somebody tries to bring correction, the person has the nerve to say, oh, no, me and God are good. Oh, oh, so God gave you a special dispensation. God gave you a certificate. You see how quiet it got? Don't, don't look around because somebody's going to know it's you. No, listen, seriously. I say this with all the love in my heart. That is self-deception. Because it says, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. That's serious. Because God forbid we live our whole lives thinking that everything's okay and it's not. There is no recourse at the end of our life. Once we step into eternity, 
That's it. Next verse. Here we go. Here's the antidote. Here, here's the cure. If we confess our sins, he, God, is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and do what? Here it is again. And purifies from what? All unrighteousness. So if righteousness is living in the awareness that everything between us and God is okay, then unrighteousness is what? We're living as if we're completely unaware of the right standing that we have with God. You listening? We step out of position. God puts us in this position. Now, as far as, we're, as, far as he's concerned, we're there. But every once in a while, we roll around in the dirt. And I think I quoted this last week. My, my pastor, Pastor David DeMola, who's in heaven now, used to say this all the time. If you sleep with the dogs, you wake up with the... And so that's what happens sometimes when we step out and step into sin, even though God has designated us as righteous, treats us as if we've never sinned, but we step out and we start living like somebody who's not aware that we've been forgiven, not aware that we've been purchased by the blood of Jesus. And when you get into that stuff, you pick things up. Not enough of you were saying amen, not because I need to hear it, but is it a reality to you? We step out of that. We start acting like an unrighteous individual. But look at how awesome this promise is. Do you really look at how awesome this promise is? If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just and will forgive us our sins. We know. Everybody goes, Pastor, I know my sins are forgiven. Past, present, future. That's wonderful. But what about the fleas you picked up? Can I get even more real? What about... What about the sexual transmitted diseases that you might have brought home for your family? Oh, I'm going to heaven. Oh, you're going to heaven. Okay, but now your wife's got to go to the doctor. Oh, I'm so glad I came on Wednesday night. <laughs> what about the fact that you, you, you wiped out your bank account now while you were out there picking up fleas? I'm going to heaven. I know, but you can get yourself to the point where you wish that you go soon. Well, God forgives. Yeah, he does. He knew you were going to do it before he spoke the universe into existence. But that doesn't mean that the consequences are not there. Oh, you're talking good tonight, Pastor. No, come on. You see? You see how sobering that is? That's, you know, when you come to church, you're not going to be, oh, I feel so good when I leave. No. No, we feel good when we repent, when we confess our sins, and we get rid of the fleas. Amen. And the blood of Jesus will do that. Amen? Because Amen? Amen. we're glad that you're going to heaven, but, but the people around you are having to deal with the fleas. Oh, move on, Pastor. Move on. All right, so we live righteously. We live like someone who's aware of our position with God. When we sin, we are living like someone who is blind to their position with God. And that's a position of right standing. And the devil then comes with guilt and condemnation and leads you down the path further from God. Oh, well, you're in it now. You might as well go ahead. That's how cycles work. That's how cycles work. Anybody brave enough to raise their hands and say, I know what that means? That's how cycles work. <laughs> Praise God. Hallelujah. Thank God for Pastor Joe. <laughs> so Psalm 29, verse 1, and I think we're going to start getting into more. This, this, is, this is where we need to be. Give unto the Lord, O you mighty ones. We used to sing this years ago. Give unto, give unto the Lord glory and strength. Give unto the Lord the glory due his name. Worship the Lord in the, read it with me, in the beauty of holiness. 
in the beauty of holiness. Another translation put it this way. Worship the Lord in the majesty of holiness. There is a beauty. There is a majesty. There is a, I don't know, I want to use the word radiance maybe. There is something that when we, when we as an act of our will, decide, no, I'm not going to fall for that temptation. No, I'm not going to let those fleas in my life. No, I'm going to, if, if my flesh hurts, if I have to, my, if my body has to ache, I am not going for that. There's something that happens when you cross over that line. And usually crossing over the line has a negative connotation. This has a very positive connotation. When you cross on, you go, yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I can do that. I can do that. Yeah, I know I'm forgiven, but I would rather honor the Lord Jesus Christ. I would rather reverence the spirit of God. I would rather nurture that anointing that's within because it keeps us sensitive to the voice of God. Is anybody getting anything tonight? Do you hear what I'm saying? And this, this is so contrary to what we're being bombarded with constantly. Go enjoy yourself. You only got one life. I have parents tell their kids. I, I know of a parent. I know, I know of parents who were angry with their sons because their sons refused to watch pornography. They thought their kids were weird because they would not watch pornography. What's wrong with these kids? You're, you're not a normal male. You're not a normal uh, young man. You're not. Could you imagine that? There's a beauty to holiness. That, that, that word holiness translates from the typical Hebrew word for, for holy, obviously. It carries the concept of being set apart. Common stuff is common stuff. You don't compare common stuff with something that's rare. You don't abuse something that's rare and make it common. And when we think about, now now listen to me closely here. Again, this is a message of awareness, not guilt and condemnation. If we would just think what it cost the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross, forget about that, what started in the Garden of Gethsemane, the emotional breakdown, the, 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 the level of anxiety and stress, knowing what he was gonna suffer within the next 24 hours. When we think about what he, what he endured, the, the phys, even the physical pain, but then having to go into the realm of the spirit like a person who's damned and endure all the torment and torture of, of, of the kingdom of darkness, if we would just put that before our eyes, when some filthy thing, some degenerate thing, some common thing wants us to step in and dishonor that blood and dishonor all that Jesus did for us, I think that would restrain us. You remember back in the Old Testament, the first covenant, okay? Joseph, brother sell him into slavery. He ends up, because I'm going to really condense this, he ends up in a man named Potiphar's house. Potiphar, one of the wealthiest individuals in the Egyptian kingdom. And he saw that Joseph was such an awesome administrator. He knew he could trust this young man. He put everything in his care, all of his wealth, all of his household, all the other servants. The only person that wasn't subject to him or submitted to him was Potiphar's wife. You know the story. She's seen this handsome young guy. Who knows what Potiphar was like? I don't know. <laughs> so she's watching this young kid. And she's watching this young guy coming in and out of the house, and he's, he's smart, he's intelligent, he's good looking. And she goes after him. And there's something that he says that should set the standard for all of us. She tries to lure him to have physical relations. And he says, 
how can I sin against God? And how can I sin against my master who's given me everything except you? That sense of gratitude, that sense of honor caused him to resist that temptation. We're talking about staying free. We're talking about getting free and staying free. Again, there's no magic wand. You develop this. This is not something that all of a sudden, bam, lightning bolt hits you when your life changes. Remember this. When you got born again, your spirit was affected. Not your soul. What are you talking about, Pastor? Let's go through the whole thing. The Trinity is God the Father, God the Son. Come on. God the Holy Spirit. Triune in nature, right? And the Bible tells us in Genesis chapter 1 that God created us in his likeness and in his image. So if you and I have been created in his image and in his likeness, then there should be something triune about us. And it is. We are spirit. We have a soul. And we live in a body. Now watch this. When you said, Jesus, I believe in you, come into my heart. Be my Lord, be my Savior. It wasn't your body that was affected. It wasn't your soul that was affected. It was your spirit. You, your spirit came alive unto God. Okay? Now, the process that we're in, from the moment that we said yes to Jesus to the moment that we take our last breath and go into eternity, is getting our soul to be affected by our spirit. That's a process. That's what the Bible refers to as sanctification, which sanctification and holiness are the same thing. To sanctify something means to set it apart. Amen? You getting this? Now, God gets us born again, but we have to cooperate with him for the sanctification process. We have to say no to the things that we know are going to pull us away from God. We have to say no to the things that are going to dishonor the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Some of you are getting it. Some of you are just hanging out like, I'll wait till he says something that I can be happy about. Listen, if you want to sin, you can sin. That ability has not been taken from us, but it's a choice. If God would have taken that ability away from us, he would have made us into robots, not children. You getting this? So, God, in the book of Genesis, it tells us that God made the seventh day, and he set it apart. What did he do with the seventh day? He made it holy. It's set apart. Okay? Um, In the book of Exodus, we're told Moses got instruction from God that the firstborn child of the nation of Israel, every firstborn child was set apart for God. Amen? Now, the Hebrew word for beauty, remember we're talking about the beauty of holiness, remember? The Hebrew word for beauty in this verse carries the idea, and I want you to listen to this word, the idea of intrinsic. Say that with me. Intrinsic beauty and worth. It's not passing, it's not shallow beauty. So that's the beauty beauty of holiness refers to the intrinsic attractiveness of being set apart. Set just like we have righteousness, we have set apartness. What does that mean? We live our lives. God wants us to live our lives set apart, not haughty not prideful, not thinking that we're better than anybody else. And, you know, we get accused of that stuff. Oh, no, you Christians think you're better. No, no, no. No, we just know that we're separate. And for your sake, who are lost, you better thank God that we're separate. Because when we lose our separateness, then we become just like the rest of the world, and we're no use to anybody. This ain't going to be popular, but listen to me. We're not supposed to be just like everybody else. We're not supposed to be just like everybody else. If you come to my house for dinner, 
and I put a plastic plate in front of you, something's wrong. Because if you come to my house for dinner, in order to honor you and to show the value of our relationship, I should go and look for the best dishes, the best flatware, the best napkins, the best. Why? Because we show our value for the other person by how we treat them. And what ends up happening most of the time in the world that we live in right now, I'm talking about, the, excuse me, in the church world that we live in right now, is that most people want to bring God down and make him like us instead of allowing him to take us out of this world and to be more like him. Amen. A Christian who's going to heaven filled with the Spirit of God, but lives like just everybody else in this world, does not attract anyone to the kingdom of God. What am I going to be attracted to you if you're living worse than I am? How am I going to come to you with my problems if you look like you've been beat up by yours? Well, I don't know if I'm coming here on Wednesday nights anymore. You understand what I'm saying? Get free, stay free. Why? Because the same people that watched you when you weren't free are watching you now. Okay, let's talk about this, this word intrinsic. I had to go look it up. Because I wasn't sure I had the right the right definition in my, own, in my own heart. And this is what I found out. Intrinsic means the value never changes. You listening? It does not fluctuate. It refers to a commodity that always carries the same value no matter what conditions change. And truthfully, there's only one thing I could think. There's only one commodity I can possibly think of and that is the presence of God in our lives. His holiness, his goodness, his faithfulness never changes. It doesn't fluctuate. He's just as good on the day that you're doing good, and he's just as good on the day that you're you're living in the gutter. He doesn't change. You listening? Holiness has never lost its value no matter what Society says it is precious in the sight of God. So I found this little illustration here. Consider a rare and expensive diamond. Its rarity sets it apart from the rest of the diamonds. What do we do with such a special diamond? Do you throw it on a table in a garage sale? No. We appreciate its beauty by giving it its own special display case. Could be all of the diamonds there, all kinds of diamonds. Well, what about that one right there? Oh, no, that's special. We keep it in a special case. It's set apart from the other ones. So which one do you think gets more attention? The ones that are just scattered on a piece of cloth or the one that's in a special case? Sometimes I might even put it in a special room reserved just for that diamond. We walk differently when we live separate from the world and separate from sin. We walk differently when we, when we, when we get our body in line and say, no, you're not going to do that. No, mind, no, you're not going to think those thoughts as soon as we catch them. So saying, you, can't, you're not, you can't help the thoughts that come to you, but we don't have to entertain them. Yes or no? Yes. We shine differently when we live selflessly. I'm telling you, you've got to throw yourself into other people's lives or you're never going to develop this character that's needed to get free and stay free. You can't. As long as, as, long as life revolves around me, I'm always going to want to fulfill my desires. 
And there is something about purposefully and willingly making sacrifices that trains our soul. No, no, you're not going to be first. Jesus is going to be first. But I, but I want to do this. I want to buy this. I want to go here. I want to go. Yes, you do it with God's permission. That's, that's a thought, huh? We do it with God's permission. And there is sometimes when God gives us permission, and there's other times when God gives us a red light. Now, you following the green lights and the red lights is what the Bible talks about, being led by the Spirit of God. This church exists because of an experience that, that, that this very experience I'm talking about that began to develop in me in 1994. Seems like a lifetime ago. I knew the Lord was dealing with me. I knew it was time for me to step out of the life that I was living. And I was a Christian for 11 years already. But it was time to step out. It was time to start, start stepping on the path that God had, the plan of God for my life. Are you listening to me? They say, we well, are talking about yourself. I don't know your story. I know my story. I was there. And the way the Lord led me was on the inside, I would come to, to a place of having to make a decision about something, and I would sense a green light. So I would keep going forward until I, until I sensed the red light. Stop. Wait. Green light. Time to move forward. Or maybe it's time to make a right-hand turn. Or maybe it's time to make a left-hand turn. And that's how I perceive, and I, I can't explain to you 100%, but my, even, even my prayer life was taking on that kind of, okay, what am I praying for? Well, Lord, I feel like this is important. No, red light, this is important. Pray for this. And that's how he began from 1994 to 1995 to come to the conclusion that God was leading my wife and myself to sell our business here in town, travel all the way to Tulsa, Oklahoma, to a place I'd never been to before. Thank God that the Caps came with us, Pastor Pam, Pastor Cap. Of course, none of us were pastors. Well, in God's eyes, we were. But we went, spent two years out there to get trained, understanding full, fully understanding that in the fall of 1997, this church would start. New Beginnings Christians, that time, New Beginnings Christian Fellowship would launch out. Series of green lights, learning, to, learning, to, learning that still small voice here, learning the impressions of the Holy Ghost. You I hope you understand what I'm saying. There's impressions we get from the Holy Ghost. Paul, Paul said in the book of Acts, it seemed right to the Holy Ghost and me to take the direction that he took or to not take the direction they took. You understand, if you read the book of Acts, Paul at one point was turning one direction to go preach the gospel, and the Holy Spirit stopped him. And then right after that, he has a dream about a man in Greece saying, come over and help us. And that's how the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ ended up in Europe and not in China at that point in time. You understand what I'm saying? It's so vitally important. How important is it as it pertains to this subject? You don't think the Holy Ghost knows what temptations are up ahead for you? You don't think the Holy Spirit knows what weaknesses you're dealing with or not dealing with? You don't think the Holy Spirit knows the wounds and the hurts that has formulated your personality at this point in season of life? Of course he does. Psalm 103 tells us like a father has pity on his children. So the Lord has compassion on us. It says that he knows that we're, we're just dust. He knows what we're made of. He knows what you're made of. He knows the wounds. He knows the hurts. He knows the things that are going to trigger you to go one way or the other. But you see, what good is it him knowing it if you don't develop an ear to hear from him? And so you could be in the middle of a conversation. The Holy Spirit will say to you, don't take it the way it sounds right now. Put this aside, because this is going to damage you. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Okay. He'll warn you sometimes. No, um, I really don't want you getting involved in this relationship right now. Would to God that many of us would have listened to that voice. 
How much, how much hardship would be saved by individuals? But you see, you've got to develop an ear to hear. Got to develop an ear to hear. And say, so, well, Pastor, it's easy for you to hear, Pastor. No, no, honey, listen to me. If I didn't develop that ear to hear back in 94, I would have never got this far. I'd still be slicing bologna someplace. And if that was God's will for my life, that's fine. But it wasn't. It wasn't. Amen? He'll do the same thing for you. So when we walk separate from the world, separate from sin, when we, when we bring our flesh under subjection and submission to the word of God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, we live differently. We walk differently. We project to others differently. If you're all beat up with guilt and condemnation because you know you're not living right, and God happens to send somebody across your path that's beat up, bruised, just been traumatized by life, you're not going to have the confidence to minister to that person. So it's not only your life that gets affected, it's somebody else's destiny that may be thwarted. You and I cannot afford the luxury of just living in sin and living any way we want. You, just, it's, you can't do it. Because it's not going to be without consequence. Somebody might as well tell you. Well, pastor, what happened to the grace message? Oh, this is the grace message. It's God's grace when he alerts us to a situation that's going to bring disaster in our life. Awareness, we're talking about developing that alert, being alert to the spirit of God. When we walk in holiness, we train our souls and our bodies. We train, we train. See, your spirit got, got transformed, bam, like that. Your spirit got regenerated in a second. It went from being dead to God to alive unto God. But our souls need to be trained, need to be disciplined. And sometimes it's rough especially the older you are, and if you've been living with whatever habits and lifestyles you've been living in, the longer you've been living with that, the harder it is to un untrain that behavior. But we have to. Awareness breeds resistance. We're talking about resistance to sin, which is the opposite of self-deception. I'm going to say it again. Awareness breeds resistance. It is the op awareness is the opposite of self-deception. If I'm aware... Let's say, let's say I find myself in a particular season of touchiness. I know it never happens to you. Touchiness, oversensitive. Like every, every little thing that somebody says, you get like, well, what did you mean by that? I just said hello. You understand what I'm saying? Now watch this now. If I'm aware that I'm in that season, I'm going to look on the inside. And I'm going to say, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what's going on? Why am, I, why am I, why is it that something that deserves this much of a reaction, I'm given this much of a reaction? Why am I so, like, you know what I'm saying? Like knee-jerk reactions, like touch, like your last nerve. You ever, have nerve, you ever go to the dentist and they hit that thing, you go, whoa. When you're like that in your soul, you need to step back and ask the Holy Spirit, what's going on? Why, why, am, I so, why am I so touchy? Because let me tell you what, if you ignore that, you will ignore the warning sign that the enemy has you within his sights. You can, you can know when the enemy has you, has you within his sights by your touchiness. When you get over touchy, like, he goes, oh, it's like a warning sign. Oh, oh, here's one, here's one. Attack this one, attack this one, because they're feeling sorry for themselves right now. Attack this one. Because they're wounded, right? Attack this one because they just, they just dragged up an incident that happened 30 years ago. Attack this one. Is anybody getting anything? Yes. Awareness breeds resistance. It is the opposite. Awareness is the opposite of self-deception. Self opposite. Be alert to your surroundings, both physical and spiritual. Be aware of your surroundings. If we could see into the realm of the spirit, my Lord Jesus, if we could see what some people are carrying on them, I think it would frighten us. We wouldn't want to go out of the house. And yet, we rub shoulders with, with just anybody. 
Well, well, Pastor, I'm just friendly. Eh, be friendly. Be very aware of your surroundings, both spiritual and physical. Now, physical, we need to be aware of our surroundings. Okay? Not paranoid, not suspicious of everything, but be aware. Why? You have a target on your back. Turn to somebody and say, you're, you're like number one on the devil's hit list. <laughs> Don't just walk around like, oh, do, 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 do. <laughs> be aware of your, be aware. You listening to me? Yes. Oh. You going to give me a couple extra minutes? All right, because you got to finish this thing. My wife and I were in Florida one time, many years ago, probably over 20, no, probably 30 years ago. We went to a little shopping center that happened to be by my parents' home. There was a gift shop there. As soon as we crossed the threshold to go into this, this uh, gift shop, something on the inside was like, I'm like, now, now, now it's, I said, Barb, there's something wrong in this place. Let's get out of here. Oh, come on. I want to look at this thing. On here. Barb. I said, okay. So now I realize, okay, now, why should we go? We have authority. So I started praying in the spirit. I'm walking around the gift shop praying in the spirit. The woman at the cash register pulls out this gold disc. And oh, I wish I had something here. Um, what do you got there? Your phone? Give it to me real quick. I give it, I'll give it back. <laughs> And she pulls out this gold disc, and she's watching me and my wife is walking around. She's at behind the kitchen, and she starts tapping this golden disc. And then I saw it had a pentagram on it. I said, oh, the devil just showed his cards. So the more I walked around the store praying in the spirit, the more she, she must have wore her wrist out that day. The more she's tapping this thing, I guess in her mind, it was to conjure up some kind of witchcraft power. What is it? Now, I could have ignored it and went, oh, yeah, well, maybe it's just indigestion. No, no, your spirit is trying to tell you there's something wrong here. Either, either take authority over it or get out of here. You listening to me? Be aware. Be aware of your surroundings. I'll tell you a couple more. Want me to tell you a couple more? Because these are really, like, blatant, obvious ones, okay? Um. I guess it was about 10 or 12 years ago. My wife and I rented a place in Brigantine on, by the beach, okay? We were there for two weeks, I don't know what it was. Brigantine, Brigantine Beach is pretty unique. I don't know how it is now because after Sandy, everything got disrupted. But there's usually always a, what do you call that? Like a sandbar that forms, and then the water will come over that sandbar and then when the tide goes out, that water gets left there. You know what I'm talking about? I don't know what you call it, like a tidal pool, I guess you would call it. This one was about two and a half feet deep. So we had just got done having dinner. I said to my wife, I'm going to go take a walk. I'm going to take a walk over to the beach. I'll be back in a little while. I walk over to the beach, and I, don't, I love walking in those tidal pools. It's like so cool, you know. I'm walking, and maybe about three minutes into it, I hear, get out of the water now, as loud as anything on the inside. Get out of the water right now. Like, <laughs> I start walking back to the house. There's a group of teenagers sitting on, on a bench or something there. And they said to me, did you see the shark? And I turn around and I see this thing with the, the one fin over here and the back fin about over here. Oh, it was a small one. Small one or not. It doesn't take a big one to take a chunk out of your leg. Now, see, did I see it naturally? No. But the Holy Ghost knew it was there. Now, now, if he'll warn us about something like that, don't you think he'll warn us about temptation that's heading our way? Don't you think he'll warn us? Now, please, when I say this, please, I, yes, we got to walk in love. But you also got to walk in wisdom. Don't you think he will warn you about somebody who's trying to infiltrate your life? But they're so sweet. They have such a wonderful smile. 
They're so generous. They're so nice. What do you think the devil's going to show up with red pajamas and a pitchfork? <laughs> Be alert. Be alert. Another time in Florida. My parents were building a new house. They said, why don't you ride over and see the house? It's, it's still under construction. I pull in the driveway. As soon as my feet hit the driveway, I hear on the inside, be careful where you walk. There's a rattlesnake here. So what do you think I did? Very careful where I'm walking. Very careful. I go in. I'm gonna come back. Get in the car. Okay. I get back to the house. My brother was there. I told him where it was. He goes, did you see the rattlesnake? I said, what do you mean? He goes, there was a rattlesnake this morning on the driveway. It probably went into the bushes on the side of the house. Oh, well, that's because you're a pastor. No, no. I'm a child of God. That the Holy Ghost on the inside of me. You're the same person developed. I'm sure you could sit here with stories too of how the Lord warned you about certain things. But listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. The way that he will warn us about some natural danger is the same way he will alert us to temptations that we're going to face. I mean, some stuff is obvious. You get born again, you come out of whatever kind of background. And then you're going to go back and hang around with your friends that are still in that background. That's not wise. Well, no, you don't know, Pastor. I'm going to get them saved. No, honey, they're going to chew you up. Go get yourself established in the faith first. Go get yourself strong so that you will affect them instead of them affecting you. Turn to somebody and say, he's talking right tonight. I know some of us don't want to hear this stuff. Listen, you cannot live in denial and experience victory. You can't live in denial. You can't live in denial and experience victory. Now, if we pray, we ask God for help, he will help us pinpoint those problem areas so that we can overcome them on a daily basis. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13, we're going to wrap this up. The temptations in your life are no different from what others experience, and God is faithful. He will not allow the temptation to be more than you can stand. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you can endure. But you don't understand, Pastor. You don't understand. I just, I just didn't even realize what was happening. No, 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 honey. There's always that few seconds there, okay, that you have a choice. That you have a choice. That you have a choice. There's always that few seconds when that thing pops up on the computer screen. You got a couple of seconds to click off. Oh, my hand won't cooperate. Well, Jesus said, cut it off. Oh, Lord. Now, all right, let's do this real quick. Galatians 6, uh, Proverbs chapter 15, verse 22. Plans fail. Come on, read it with me real quick. Plans fail for lack of counsel, but with many advisors, they succeed. In other words, if you're going to go through life on your own, you're going to, you're going to get beat up. But if you'll surround yourself with people that you can trust, so, so have a plan. Get a plan. Galatians chapter 6, verse 1. Brothers and sisters, so who's this written to? Us. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in a sin, you who live by the Spirit should restore that person. Say it again. But watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill the law of Christ. Now, let's talk about this, okay? Go back to verse 1. Brothers and sisters, if someone is caught in the sin, you who live by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, should restore that person gently, but watch yourselves, or you also may be tempted. How are we tempted? Now, let's go here.
How about if we develop an attitude that when we see somebody fall into sin, we say on the inside, that could never happen to me. What's he saying? Be careful. Be careful. Watch that also, you may be tempted, but watch yourselves. Restore the person gently, not with, not with condemnation, not with guilt. You listening to me? Gently. But watch this now. Watch your attitude. I'm watching a situation right now. I won't give you a lot of details. Where I'm seeing an individual who judged somebody else is becoming the same individual. You hearing me? Oh, Pastor, pff, I can't believe so. Could, Jerry, could you, I can't believe so and so did this. Oh, I, that would never happen to me. I'm, I'm, I, I've beat that area already. Oh, my God. We love to point the finger. We love to judge. Be careful. Be careful. And the other thing here, we're supposed to carry each other's burdens, yes? Yes. But don't live like it's everyone else's responsibility to keep you free. Well, you know, if somebody was there to answer the, the phone call at 3 o'clock in the morning, maybe I wouldn't have, this wouldn't have happened to me. Maybe if, maybe if somebody would have, would, have, would have came and grabbed me and stopped me. No, no, honey, you got, God ain't even going to do that for you because he respects your free will. Yeah, we're to hold each other, and, and, and hold each other up and we're to, to carry each other's burdens. And we need people to hold ourselves accountable to, like I said in Proverbs. However, you can't make it somebody else's responsibility for you. Well, you know what? I fell into sin because, you know what? Well, you weren't there for me. Tough, isn't it? You see how quiet it gets? Because our society has brainwashed us and thinking that it's everybody else's responsibility for our life. No, it's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. Not the government's responsibility to feed you. Not the government's responsibility to hand you out checks for doing nothing. That shows they don't love you. Use your faith. Build your faith. Build that relationship between you and God. You'll never lack. Amen. Never. But when you lean on somebody else, what does it tell us in Proverbs? A person that's undependable is like a broken tooth and a broken leg. You ever try to chew a piece of steak on a broken tooth? What happens? The pain just shoots right up your neck. You go, man, I'll never eat on that side again. You can't, Listen. If you're going to live your life dependent on everybody else and what they're going to do for you, you're going to live disgusted, frustrated, disappointed all of your life. You have to develop some discipline of your own. You've got to say to yourself, when, you're, when you know that you're, when you know you're starting, when you know the enemy has set you up, when you know that he's starting to put temptations in your path, you've got to say, no, I will not dishonor the Lord Jesus Christ. I will not grieve the Holy Spirit that's within me. I will not jeopardize my family and my children and my grandchildren and my great-grandchildren. It's better that they bless you than they would curse you in the future. Well, you're making it sound like it's such a big deal. <laughs> Sit down with some of us <laughs> that made some mistakes. <laughs> it is a big deal. And listen, to those of us that are on the other side of 50, on the other side of 60, how many years you got left to correct the mistakes? When you're young, you could be foolish. It's better that you're not, but when you're young, if you make a mistake, you got decades ahead of you. There's nothing worse than an old fool. Yes or no? Yes. Did you learn anything? Yes. All right. Are you going to come back next Wednesday? Yes. 
We'll start something else. All right? Why don't you stand up? Stand up, stand up, put, put one hand up to God. Say this with me. Father, Father in, the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I present myself, I present myself unto, you, unto you as a vessel of honor. That's what I desire to be. Holy Spirit, when I'm faced with temptation, rise up mightily within me. Remind me of the blood of Jesus. Remind me of all that he suffered. Remind me of the people that are counting on me. Give me the ability to say no. I'll thank you for all of eternity. I declare that I am a vessel of God set apart unto his use, sanctified, made holy, set apart for special, not common, special. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for giving me the opportunity to be transformed. I bless you. I thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.